the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Thank you, God bless you. Thank you, God bless you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Let me see that. Woo! Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, let's be seated. God bless you unless you want to be standing. Um, God is good. You see, the world that we live in is a multi-dimensional world. You can be standing in the same place where Alexis is sitting right now and be in a different dimension to her. And you know, for about a year and a half now, I've been stressing and emphasizing the need for us to be multi-dimensional thinking beings. All right, I see some people are not very happy. Why don't you get up and go say hello to somebody? Oh yeah, yeah. Because Alan skipped that part. And I'm like, people are like, oh, I wanna go say hello to Kayla. I haven't seen her in a while. All righty, let's do it. Let's go say hello to people. Find some hands that you can shake, some necks that you can hug. Oh, show love to somebody tonight. Oh, show love to somebody tonight. Shake some hands and hug some necks. And tell them how much you love them in Jesus' name. Somebody shake the pastor too. Or oh, y'all just wanna love and each other. Come on, Cody. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. Praise God. Let's bring it in. Oh, show your love to somebody tonight. Come on, let's go. As we head back to our own seats. Come on. Praise God. All righty. That's it. Let's go back to our seats, everybody. Thank you. All righty, all righty. Okie dokie. So if we're here till 10 o'clock today, it's going to be on the band. Yeah, because that was supposed to be like 20 seconds of greeting one another, but... You know, you can't hear music like that and, and shut off the party. Yeah, God is good. Alrighty, so we're gonna just uh, quickly uh, talk about this dimensional thing uh, because while worship was on, I recognized that it is very possible for someone to be here. Welcome, Kayla, again. It is possible for someone to be here and just be in this building. This building is only a fragment of what this place is. On some minutes or hours of the day, it's just a building. It's just a, a tin roof. But when we come together, as the Bible says, Jesus himself speaking, he says, wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, I will be there. So we immediately press into such a dimension that isn't by the making of man. We press into a dimension that even though it's the same building, it is no longer the same place. Now, when that becomes apparent to us, then guess what happens? we begin to get more out of life and out of time than what is naturally available, or what that, than what is physically available. 
You see, because when you say naturally available, sometimes we tend to think that the things of the Spirit are so far-fetched that it's not naturally available. No, the presence of God is naturally available when two or three of us are gathered. The Bible didn't say when you gather, you need to stand on your head, you need to do gymnastics, you need to get a leader to come and lead worship. No, the Bible says when you are gathered in his name, he is there. Nothing is more natural than that. But then it is up to us now to recognize it and be able to press into it. You know what happened to Jacob? Jacob was visited by God and he did not know. It wasn't until he woke up that he says, oh, the Lord was here and I knew it not. Do you know how many of us have had such opportunities to tap into the presence of God and yet we don't? Now, let me say this, because some people wonder, oh, how do I get into this presence of God? Ask yourself, how do I manage to get out of the presence of God? You know, the same process by which you can be here while service is going on, while worship is going on, and still you're making pudding at home, is the same way you can press further into the presence of God. Your thoughts, you know, some, someone can be here the Holy Spirit is visiting with a man right here. The angels are flanking him on either side and he is seeing things and hearing things, but you are at home cleaning your garage. And how do you manage to do that? By your imagination, your thought, because we are multidimensional human beings. And so it is not left to you to apply yourself in the direction of progress and apply yourself in the direction of blessings. I tell people, God is committed to not just doing the things you ask for. God says, I will do even the things that you imagine. The Bible says that God has a commitment to do what? To do exceedingly abundantly above. You know, the Bible did not say exceedingly and abundantly. He says, no, exceedingly abundantly. So he's already going to do abundantly, but he's not even saying, he's not just going to be abundantly. He's going to be exceedingly abundantly above what you ask or imagine. So basically, I don't know, there are things that I don't even ask for. I just imagine it. Because I know God is not just paying attention to my words. He's also paying attention to my thoughts and imaginations. The Bible says that the eye of the Lord is running to and fro upon the earth, seeking for that man whose mind is stayed on him. God is not just looking for people who are calling his name. He's looking for the people who are even just thinking about him. So if I, by my imagination, can be present in 500 places at the same time, imagine what's going to happen if I can pull all those resources together and align them to just have one focus, and that is on the throne of God. Imagine how beautiful that is going to be. Jesus said to a couple of people a while back, he says, you know what your problem is? Is that you're focusing on things that don't enrich you. He says, and what you focus on is what comes into you. And if all, if all of what you focus on is taken from you life rather than giving to you life, then that means you are completely lifeless. Someone says, where did Jesus say that? He said, if the light in you be darkness, how deep is that darkness? He said, that is a real, really, that is a really, really deep darkness. And to Jesus, Light and darkness means something totally different. In John chapter 1, the Bible says that in him was life. And that life was the light of men. In the dimension of men, it is light. But in heaven, it is life. And so when Jesus says, let your eye be single and your entire body will be full of light, what he is saying in essence is that if you would allow all of your thoughts and all of the portals of your mind to be stayed on the one that sustains you and gives you life, he says your entire body will be full of light. That means your spirit will be full of life. But quite often we are doing the most. We're here, we're there. But when we come into the presence of God, you see, the way that I worship when I'm here is I worship God when I'm here with the mindset of an open window that is only open for a brief period of time. Because after a while, Chris is going to go home. 
because he needs to go to bed early for his golf game tomorrow. <laughs> you understand what I mean? And so after a while, Kenyatta is going to go home. Everyone's going to leave. And so what am I going to do at that time? I'm going to go home also and continue to enjoy the presence of God, the kind of God's presence that is available in such a home. But for the time that we're here, I want to make the most of it because there is a special commitment that God made to us when we gather like this. So I tap into it because I don't know when this, I, sometimes I don't even know how many songs they're singing. So I'm not waiting until the second or the third song to tap into it. I tap into it right from the moment we're getting here simply because I know that there is stuff available on the other side and there's nothing stopping me from getting there. Imagine if somebody said to you that there was $1 million on this stage. I'm sure Stephanie is not going to be sitting where she's at. We're going to be sitting very close waiting for someone to say, time to grab it. And in my own case, I don't even wait. I want to be told to go back first. You understand what I mean? Then wait for someone to tell me to come up. The moment I'm here and the wealth is on the stage, I want to jump right into it. I would rather jump in first and be told saying, slow down, take it easy. Rather than wait until they said, now let's do it. What if the other person is quicker than me at getting to where the million dollars is? But that is how we are when it comes to the presence of God. We know theoretically that everything that we need is in the water. But we're still waiting to see whether Canada is going to get in first. Like, I don't want to be the first in that water. Oh, I want to be the first in that water. I want to be the first in his presence. I want to press in because there is a lot for me in there. You see, I can't stress these things enough. The other day I was here. Okay, let's not even go into that because the moment I go into that, the Holy Spirit said to me, that's a whole rabbit trail on its own. So let's open our Bibles once again to the book of Jeremiah. This time around, we're going to read a scripture that we may not have read in a while. Jeremiah chapter 11. We're going to read about two or three verses, actually two verses. Jeremiah eleven seventeen is where we're going to start from. And... Okay. Jeremiah 11. Praise the Lord. Every single one of us carry a blessing that is for other people. And the Lord said this to me, I think, on Tuesday when we were here. And I just kind of like said, okay. But then he had already said that to me before we got here. So I think on Sunday he started to show that to me. But it was one of those things that is like the Lord is offering you, but you're not ready for it or you're not particularly, you know, enthusiastic. And so I repent in this very moment because as soon as I mentioned it again, I, I, at first I thought it was just on Tuesday, but the Lord's been showing it to me before then. And he said to me that you need to encourage your brothers and sisters to offload what they carry so that they can get what they need. You see, because what you have been given is a test. It's a placeholder. You have someone else's blessing and until you put it down, you do not get what you need. And why would God do that? For so many reasons. Because what God has in your hand that belongs to somebody else at some point may have been your blessing but now you're done with it you need to pass it on so that you can receive the fresh release but many of us just don't know yet that that is how things work we'll go around complaining saying God I've been asking you for this I've been asking you for that and God is like yes 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 I have said yes to all of those things they are yours but you haven't made room for us to deliver it we came and there is no place to deposit it simply because you're still carrying other people's blessings in your storehouse and what I'm saying to you today I say by the grace of God because this is what's been missing for many of us and so I want us to make room right now. Turn to someone next to you and tell them, if you see me, you can have it. 
if you see me, you can have it. You know that lately, Alan's been stressing to us about the transference of the anointing, the blessing, the mantle from Elijah to Elisha. And Alan spoke to me a couple of days ago and was like, I know that's where we're at, but there is more. And I told him, I said, yeah, there is more. And the Holy Spirit said to me, he knows there's something in front of him and he just can't see it. He says, help him see it. So I told him, I said, the reason why Elijah said to Elisha, if you can see me when I'm being taken up, you can have a double portion of the anointing. I said, do you know the reason why he said that? When Elijah was alive and running his ministry, there was something that was said about that unction. It was described as fire shut up in the bones. When you have fire in your bones, no matter how close a person is to you, they cannot see it. So Elisha knew that there was something behind this man of God. And he wanted it. But because it's hidden in the bones and it is fire, there's no way it can be extracted and given to another man. So what Elijah did was, Elijah already knew how he was going to be taking up. He knew that he was going to be taking up in a chariot of fire. So the, the system of transportation was powered by the same thing that powered the ministry of Elijah. Elijah's ministry was fueled by the fire of heaven. And he wanted to give of that fire to Elisha, but he says the fire is shut up in my bones. He didn't just say that it is present in my bones. It's like, man, I want to give it to you, but it's in my bones and it is shut up there. It's for me. But I also want to give it to you. But for you to receive it, you need to see me when I am leaving because when I'm leaving, the same vessel that comes to pick me up is powered by the same fire. And at that time, you can have it. And at that point, it is not just a little that I'm carrying in my bones. It is from the source. So you can even have double if you want it. The moment you understand, then you become so enthusiastic about letting someone else have what you carry. You see, because the more determined you are to pass it on, the more your alarm rings in heaven for the storehouse to be brought closer. And at that particular point in time, not only do they get blessed, you get elevated. So I haven't said that. I want you to search within yourself and find that virtue and let them have it. You see, the woman with the issue of blood understood the principle that I just shared with you. Remember what she said to herself. She said, if I may but touch the hem of his garment. And I've explained to you before and I'm going to say it again in this light. She said, I will be made what? Whole. Now, everybody there was rubbing shoulders with Jesus. There were people who were close enough to tell what kind of perfume he was wearing or not. Some people were close enough to tell you the tag on his shirt. But they could not see him even though they were close. Now, how do I know? Because if they had seen him, they would not have come that close to him. Let me explain that again. Because if they saw him in his glory, and if they saw, have you ever seen any one of those prophets in scripture that saw the Lord in his glory who came close? 
No, they will give that presence, the reverence that is due. But the woman saw Jesus and he knew that he was the high priest. He saw Jesus in his priestly form. And that was why she said, if I can touch the hem of his garment, because she was a daughter of Israel. And Jesus confirmed it. She, he said, daughter of Israel. Because she was a daughter of Israel, she was a student of scripture. And she knew that there was a prophecy concerning the Messiah, that the Messiah would come and it will be our high priest, ministering unto the Lord day and night for his people. And if Jesus were the high priest, then that other prophecy will be fulfilled that says that he will have healing in his wings. The word translated wings is the same word that refers to the design of the pomegranates that are attached to the hem of the garment of the high priest. They call it wings because it's attached to the to the hem of the, of, the, of the garment. And so when everybody was seeing a carpenter who became a rabbi, who was wearing a very fancy robe, Jesus was standing there and the woman was seeing the high priest whose garment had the pomegranates of blessings and healing. And that was why she said, if I may but touch the hem of his garment. So what happened was she saw him and that was why she had the blessing. And Jesus says, virtue left me. This lady received something today. Jesus never healed anybody else and felt like he's giving something out. Those people were picking up crumbs, right? The Syrophoenician woman, when she came looking for blessings, looking for healing, Jesus was like, oh, healing is the children's meat. She was like, I get it. She said, but when the children are eating, the dogs can feed off the crumbs. And Jesus was like, uh oh, come on now. She, he said, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Because basically the woman's eyes were open to see that what she was asking from Jesus was already given. Dogs don't beg you for crumbs, it's already there. But many of us don't know because we don't see. So I want to encourage you today. It is time for you to be a blessing to somebody. Now, this thing is very seasonal. You know, there are seasons wherein we're expected to be a bit more generous. And this is one of those seasons wherein you are supposed to find virtue within you. This principle operates in another way. Can I tell you very quickly? And then we're going to go into Jeremiah. Jesus said when he told the parable of the talents that there was a man, a rich man, someone of royalty who was going away on a long journey. And what did he do? He gave out talents to three of his servants. And he gave one five. The other one was given how many? Two. And one was given just one. And when he came back, the one that he gave five to had multiplied the five. It had become ten. But the mister, I know it all. Mister, you can't tell me what to do. Mister, it is not my fault. It is yours. Mister, I will find somebody else to blame for my failure. Was standing there with the one that he was given. And when the master came, the master said, dude, what happened? He said, because I already know that you're a wicked man. Who wants to reap where he has not sown? I took your talent and put it in the ground for safekeeping. So that when you come, I can give it back to you. Many of us are like, man, that guy was such a tout. He was such a loser. But in reality, do you know how many of us are like that? Because we take God for a wicked master. Because even though you don't say it with your mouth, you say it with your actions. Because you say things like, if God knows that he wants me to be a responsible father, to be able to provide for my children, he would have given me more money. Now you give me these children and they keep asking for money, they keep needing money, and I don't have to give. So it's not your problem, it is God's problem. 
It is God's fault, rather. You say that if God knows that I will be a missionary to this place, then why, why hasn't he provided money for me to go? That was what the man was saying. He says, you're a wicked master. You like to reap where you have not sown. You want me to raise godly children, but I can't even be a good example to them because I'm struggling. You want to reap where you have not sown. You want me to be a missionary to India, but you haven't provided the sources, the resources. That is what we say with our actions. Whereas God who gave you the one already knows exactly that it contains all that you need to be fruitful and to multiply. And so rather than saying, oh, I know you're a wicked master. What did, you, what did the master say? The master said to him, he said, if you knew that I was a wicked master, at least you could have at least still done something for yourself with what I gave you. And then when I came back, they accused me for being wicked, but then at least you will have result. But the morale of the story that I want to bring out today is in the fact that when this talent story was told, Jesus said something that many people struggle with even till today. He said, well, we're going to take the one that is in your hand and we will give it to the guy who had 10. And Jesus told us the way heaven runs and the way the earth is also set up to run. He said to him who has more shall be given but the one who has none even that which he has shall be taken away basically Jesus was saying the one who has none only thinks that he has none but we know that everyone that we send into this realm has something to give it might not be five it might not be two it might be just one but everybody has something to give if you are sent into this world without nothing then that would make god a wicked god but he isn't but the reason why we call him wicked is because we are assessing what he has given to us based on what he has given to another he says to you once again mind your business so i tell you the blessing of God in the season that we are entering into is for those who have something to give. And if you would say, I want to be a part of that blessing, then you must also be saying that I am looking to be a blessing. Let me say that again. You see, I've been checking in with God in recent times, so I shouldn't actually have been surprised that it would lead me in this direction of telling my brothers and sisters to give to one another. Because I've been pressing in and checking with God and saying to God, God, some people that I know have been asking you for things that even I know they need, but they still haven't got it. What is going on? And the Lord started to unveil one thing after another. So this is one of those things, and I want you to take it seriously. I'm talking slowly because I want everybody to get it. You need to recognize that no matter where you're at and what you might be missing, you have something that somebody else needs. Don't bury it in yourself. When he buried the talent in the ground, it's like when you keep your gift within you because you are the ground. All right? So here is the deal. I'm going to say that again and I want us to do it again. This time around, don't just look at that person and smile because we know how many of us have been in church for like 50 years and we're so accustomed to pastors saying, oh, turn around and tell your neighbor, oh, you look gorgeous today. Or tell your neighbor, oh, you are awesome today. No, this is not one of those religious tell your neighbors. This is genuinely you by faith and works activating your miracle. I want you to look at the person sitting next to you again and say to that person, you can have it. Mean it seriously that whatever it is that is the crumbs that have fallen from your table, from the blessing of God, you are genuinely saying they can have it. So I want you to say it again. Let's start from the beginning. If you can see me, You can have it. 
Now, I want, I'm going to tell you the reason why. Because I haven't told you the reason why you're saying if you can see me. Because I know the story of Elijah. I told you he said that because for you to see him leave, you will see the source of the power and you can tap into it. But in our own case today, is a little different. And I'll tell you what the Holy Spirit is saying. But your faith is also being tested. So let's see how much you believe. I want you to tell your neighbor again if you can see me. You can have it. Okay, my wife, I know that you've been borrowing Manolita from Kenyatta. So look at me. If you can see me, yeah, you can tell me, tell me, tell me. Yeah, because you know, Manolita has been saying to her husband, if you can see me, you can have it. And then she's been like, come talk to me too. Okay, talk to me. <laughs> I want to help you. I want to help you. If, oh yeah, say, if you can see me, you can have it. Now, let me tell you what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said to me, the blessing that I have for my people in this season is already delivered. It is at the door. The reason why he's saying if you can see me is because your blessing is as close to you now as Josephine is. And all you have to do is bring it in. Jeremiah 11, verse 27. Verse 17, sorry. Jeremiah 11, 17. Like I told you, we haven't read it in a while. The Bible says, let me wait for Rosemary to get there. Jeremiah 11, 17. For the Lord of hosts, who planted you, has pronounced doom against you for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. It says, for the Lord of hosts who planted you. What does that mean? The Bible says that we are the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. He says, I planted you, but you're taking the produce of the tree that you are, you're, you've taken it to the threshing floor. It has been juiced into oils and fermented into incense. While I was seeing all of that, I, the Lord your God, was delighted, waiting to receive of the produce of my planting he said, but I watched you take the incense to burn it to bar. And now you expect God to be happy? You see, <laughs> in some of the conversations that I've been having with God lately, I have been getting more and more humble and in a way almost hesitant to bring in any issues to bring up any issues because it's almost like wait a minute maybe before i come here next to bring up an issue before the lord maybe i need to call a family meeting and tell my brethren what exactly are we supposed to do that we haven't done because all these issues we're bringing up it looks like we started it it looks like it's, be, it's not because God is not being God. It's because we are not being as we should children of the Most High God. Because if we play our part, God has already played all of His. So when you play your part, it reveals the next move that God has already made on your behalf. The reason why these people are suffering such a judgment of God is because of the fact that they did not recognize that they came about because God intentionally situated them for his pleasure. I am not going to say this thing so that it sounds hypothetical. I'm going to bring it home. Many of us, we take the best of us and we burn it as an incense to Baal. Baal represents the system that we are in. And this particular iteration of Baal is called mammon. Everything that we do, if we're not careful, is about money. 
Everything that we do is about being in line with the system, paying our bills as we ought to, showing up at work as we're expected to. And the best of us is being given over to Baal and God is there. Sometimes we don't, he doesn't even get what is left. He gets nothing. Because we're too tired, we're too exhausted, we're too fragmented in our thoughts. And I want to say to you that what God is looking for in the times that we're in is not very difficult. He's only looking for the people who actually believe that he is God. The requirements for the times that we're in, as dangerous as immoral, as evil as our times have become, God is asking for just one thing. Jesus says, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? He says, I hope so. And what is faith? What does it mean to believe in God? What it means is to recognize that he is the author and the finisher, that he is the provider, that he is the all in all, that he is the first and the last. We need to recognize that no matter what it is that we need, he is the provider and he needs to get the very best of us at all times. We need to seek him diligently with all of our hearts. There will be pressures out there. There will be demands placed on you and I. But we need to put our foot down in the time that we're in and say that I will not go a whole day without spending time with the Lord. I will not go a whole conversation without saying something about the Lord. Everything that I have, he gave it to me. I'm not going to spend 30 minutes discussing politics with anybody that I have not spent three hours discussing Jesus with. You see, because the thing is, we need to recognize that the Lord is making a call here. He says, I planted you guys that I may get some fruit. You are my planting and I am getting nothing. Everything is being offered to Baal. And the Lord is saying, I just want some fruit. You can still be the tree that you want. You can dance in the rain if you want. You can wave your hands to the wind if you want. I just want some fruit. Give me something at least. You know when Jesus went to the fig tree, the same fig tree that he cursed, he was not looking for figs. I mean, you would expect that he, the Lord of all, would be looking for figs. He is saying, no, I am looking for the least that this tree can do. How do I know that? The Bible says Jesus went to the fig tree when it wasn't the season for figs. You think Jesus was ignorant? No. <laughs> All things that were made were made by him. He wrote the script of what a tree means. Because sometimes we don't think about it. You know, I've seen people who would look at the likes of Da Vinci and equate them to God. They'd be like, these guys were gods. Look at the images that they, they, they carved. Look at their paintings and look at their sculptures. I don't care how good you are at sculpturing images out of a rock. You are only making an image of something that you have already seen. You are only a photocopy machine. You may be good at it, but you're not the original. I want you to be able to imagine a human being one day just out of thin air. Imagine something that is that beautiful, that does not exist, that we have never seen before, and then maybe we can call you God. We seem to forget that the Bible says that God made the things that are seen from nothing. The world itself, all of what's in it, was formed out of nothing. So God was not copying anything. He invented everything from scratch. The idea that there will be trees. You understand what I mean? I mean, we're the only being or part of creation that once existed because God says let's make man in our image and after our likeness because he looked at himself I'm going to make a copy of myself but everything else that you see was God's creative imagination period and so the same Jesus who imagined that there will be a tree, that we have roots in the ground, that we have a trunk, that we have leaves, came in a season that was not the season of figs and had an expectation. And why did he have an expectation? Because it was demonstrating to us that the tree or a tree planted should bear fruits 
primarily for the one who planted it. And the man, Jesus, was not the one who planted that fig tree. So he demonstrated by humbling himself to not even expect a fig because he didn't plant it. Let me say that again very slowly. In case you don't know the history of fig trees in that part of the world. The Bible says Jesus had just left where? I think he had just, came out of, he had just come out of Bethany. He was in between towns. And so this is how it works. When you plant a tree back in the time of Jesus, once you harvest the fruit, you leave the rest for strangers. And before it's time for you to harvest the fruit, whatever is on the tree is free game for passers-by. So Jesus was hungry and he went to the fig tree because it was not the season for figs. When it was the season for figs, strangers do not plug the figs because they didn't plant it. Does it make sense? So when Jesus came, he knew that that fig tree was not producing figs yet, but it has leaves. And so when the fig tree has leaves, what follows? Knobs. Those knobs are the ones that eventually become figs. But the knobs can be taken by passers-by. So when Jesus came, he was only asking for a knob. And the tree did not have one to produce. And Jesus says, no longer will anyone eat of you. I used to think that that was the beginning of the curse, but that was not even a curse because Jesus, who made the tree, knows that if a fig tree has leaves without knobs, it will never produce fruits. It was a barren tree and he recognized it. And so he said, and as a demonstration to you, because I know you all are confused, he looked at his disciples, he said, to make it clear to you, this is what my father would do to every tree that does not bear fruit. Jesus was essentially quoting Jeremiah 11, 27, and, I mean 17, and the disciples did not even know. He said, every tree that is not planted by my father shall be uprooted. Every tree that is planted that does not bear fruits will also be uprooted. God takes it very seriously when it comes to our lives, hoping to find something. He's not even asking you to give him that life in return. He's just asking for that life to produce fruits that can be of benefit to the kingdom and to the glory of God. And so this is what happens when God sends somebody in need to you and you turn them back even though you have what to give. Can I say that again? Because it got really quiet in here. Sometimes, some people go to God. And they say, oh God, I need $20. And God is like, okay, we can send an angel from here to give you wisdom to make $20. Or we can just tell Rosemary, who's already sitting on 40, to give you 20. So at that particular point in time, the same God who gave you 40 is now asking for you to deliver. Because he has already given you something. And then somebody comes to Rosemary and says, hey, can I just have 20 bucks? And Rosemary's like, no. (laughs) Because I only have 40 and I'm hoping that it's 60 so I can go buy that bag. (laughs) I'm not even sure people can buy bags for 60 bucks, but you know what I mean. And that is the reason why the Bible says if anybody comes to you, if your brother comes to you in the day of need, don't ask him to come another day if it is within your power to deliver. You see, the problem with the ecclesia, with the body of Christ, is pastors who have looked into scriptures, have extracted pretty much every scripture they can find on generosity and applied it to tithes and offerings so that they can drive Lamborghinis. Whereas generosity is not about giving tithes and offerings, just generosity is about teaching people how to be like the Holy Spirit. The Bible says God gives a spirit without measure, for he is a generous spirit. Imagine if the Holy Spirit being the wind of heaven does not move. How can we breathe? You understand what I mean? And so the moment you start talking about generosity, giving to one another, people mentally shut down because it's like, okay, yeah, they want my money. No. It's different around here. This is communion house. This is not your regular church down the street. We're kingdom-minded, not money-focused. So let me help you, please. And if you're watching this online, I'm not about to take an offering. That's not what I'm prepping you for. 
You understand what I mean? What I am teaching here today is that many of us have become stale because we're not passing it on. All of our prayer time is God bless me, my children, and the cat that we have. You don't pray for nobody outside of yourself. Many of us, every money that we have ever made, we save it, we save, save, save. God did not call you and I to save money. He called us to save lives. We keep all of our time to ourselves. You've never volunteered to cut anybody's grass. You've never volunteered to watch anybody's child. You've never volunteered to do everything because you keep saying that that which you have is not enough for you and you bury it in the ground like the man with one talent. But the Bible says to him who has shall more be given. So you need to present yourself as the one that has the $20 to spare. You need to present yourself as the one that has the two hours to spare. You need to present yourself as somebody who is ready to prophesy that which you have read in scriptures and you'll be amazed at how you will prophesy what is in the mind of God next. Many of us can't even prophesy scripture to our neighbors and we expect that one day God is going to be moving us in the, in the word of knowledge, in the word of wisdom. You understand what I mean? You see, when you walked in today, Stephanie, you walked in and you were wearing the robe of a judge and I was like, okay, what is that about? And you know what that is? The Lord says in this season that you are in, you will be the one to judge your own case. That is not being under, no pressure. So it's not like God is putting the burden on you, but God is just letting you know that at this particular point in time, judge it as you see fit and heaven will execute the verdict that you pass. You understand what I mean? But I tell you something, folks, it is the power of God that makes rich, adding no sorrow. Hmm. Anita already knows where I'm going with that. The power of God makes rich. He says, I have given you, I'm the one who gives you the power to get wealth. Right? So where is the power of God? On the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that power of God came and dwelled inside of men. Somebody else is going to become rich because of you. Somebody else is going to have joy because of you. And that is the reason why God is somewhat frustrated because he has given everything to us and we're not passing it on. And it's like, hey, 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 the world is going to hell in a handbasket because y'all are doing nothing about it. You don't have to hold a thousand people crusade before you say that you're working for God. God is not interested in how many miracles you can do. He's only interested in how much kindness you can show. Jesus says when they came to him and said, wow, we did many miracles in your name. They, they told Jesus, they were trying to convince Jesus that they were qualified to press into the rest of the father. And Jesus was like, depart from me, workers of iniquity, I do not know you. And they were like, no, 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 Jesus, you must be mistaken. We are the same guys who organized the crusades. We were on television. We healed people. We raised the dead even. So what do you mean? Jesus said, like I said, I don't know you. And then the church members and some of the people who never even made it to church were standing thinking, if these TV evangelists and these pastors and these miracle workers these so-called prophets and prophetesses, if they're not going to get in, we might as well just turn back right now and look for where the directions to hell is so we can just go there. And as they were about to turn, Jesus was like, hey, friends, where are you going? And they were like, uh, you mean us? And they were like, really? He says, yes. He said, because even though y'all didn't do no miracles, he said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you offered me a cup of cold water. And Jesus said to them, whatsoever you do to the least of the brethren, you do unto me. Come into the rest of your Lord. He says, yours is the kingdom. Everything we did here is for you. But that is not the most popular thing to do. But I tell you what, that is what is required. My submission to you today, folks, is this. The Lord is saying, you are the tree that I have planted. And even before your fruitful season comes, I want you to offer the nups to the stranger. That person is only hungry. Just give to them what you have. That person is only looking for someone to agree with them in prayer. When was the last time you said to somebody, I'm going to fast with you for three days? 
You don't need money to do that. You don't need a promotion at work to do that. You don't even need a new house to fast with somebody for three days. But we always think until we receive the fig, we will not feed the stranger. And the Lord is saying, you got it backwards. Those who feed the stranger with the knobs are the ones that will have the fig. If you are not faithful with the little, who shall give to you much? I'm going to read to you one more scripture. But I will summarize everything I've said so far before I read that scripture. Because that scripture is a very dangerous scripture. It's a very powerful weapon once you know how to wield it. But this is the one thing that I believe will summarize everything that I have said so far. I want you to elevate your thinking from the level of, oh, I don't have enough to give. I am not yet in a place where I can help anybody because I need to bear my own burdens first. I want you to elevate in your mind to a place where you're saying, I am God's ambassador here on earth. And no matter how much I may be struggling in this area and in that area, I always have something to give. You need to believe that you have something to give if you will have the capacity to receive. I want to encourage you, the capacity to receive is tied to your willingness to be a blessing, your willingness to give. Let me tell you something, you don't need a platform like this one. All you need, you already have, the ability to stand and be seen. Make yourself available. Let somebody else see you. Because if they can see you, they can receive from what you have. And what God is asking you to give them is not going to hurt you. Let me tell you something. Whatever it is that you have, the Bible says there's nothing anybody has that he has not received from above. It's not going to hurt you. And let's not just think in money alone because the world around us is always thinking in money. There is so much more that you can give. But that also includes your money. Someone's going to need it. Maybe a little bit of it. But you just never know how much that is going to go for them and for you. So I want to encourage you today. Stop thinking like the one who needs help. Start thinking like the one who has help. Think like somebody who has already been helped by God. Think as somebody that God wants to use to help somebody else. It's a shift. I'll tell you a story that I've told before when we were still in the basement, I think. When I was in high school, I had a friend whose dad was so wealthy that they were afraid that if he went to school as a day student from the house, he would never grow up because everything is always available. So what they did was they sent him four hours away to the town where we grew up. And they sent him to live with one of their family members who could barely afford an apartment. She had like maybe three or four children and maybe they had two bedrooms in that house, I couldn't tell. But it was a really tiny house and they sent him there and the only way he got to school in the morning was to walk all the way to the main road and stand to wave down a car to take him to school. They didn't, the only time it, the driver would come for him was the last day of school. They would come to get him. And on the first day of school, they come to drop him off. But he always had money. They just didn't want him to grow up in an environment where he's completely spoiled. So now guess who was at a disadvantage because of his own lessons? I. I was his best friend and he would never let me spend money on anything. Whenever we went anywhere, he'd be like, don't worry, I got this, I'm paying for this. He would pay for the drinks, pay for the food, pay for the gas, he would always pay for everything. And after like two or three years, I became so dependent on him, not because I could not afford to pay for those things, but my mentality had shifted. I had become the one who was always getting looked after. And so when we finished high school, he went out of the country, I went to college. And when I got to college, my first year of college, I was always waiting for somebody to pay for the meals. And this time around, I was surrounded by people who could barely pay for their own. And so I was struggling. And one day the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, look at your life. Look at what you've been doing. You always allowed this man 
to pay for everything. Even when you had an opportunity to have surprised him, you would delay and say, I'm gonna just wait here and tell the waiter to, to, to wait a little. He will soon get here. And that was what I did. Because I knew and I thought to myself, he's the one with money, so why should I spend the little that I have? And he always did, he will show up and he will pay. And when the Holy Spirit showed that to me, he said, as long as you are waiting to be paid for, you will not have what it takes to pay. I made up my mind from that moment onwards. I took all the boys in my room, in the hostel where I was staying. I took them out to a restaurant. I'm like, let's go and eat. Some of them were like, I don't have money. I said, I got you. After I paid for everybody, one of them called me aside. He said, are you okay? He said, did your mom just send you money? I said, no. I said, I'm spending money that I already have. He said, well, you just paid for everybody. I said, then I'll do it again. I took myself out to shop. I went shopping and I bought things for myself. First time in a long time, maybe even in forever, because it was either I was spending my dad's money, my mom's money, or my friend's money. But you know what? The moment I changed that mindset, it changed my world. I became that guy from that time, by the grace of God till now, who did not have, or who does not, by the grace of God, have to wait for anybody to pay for anything. But it took that shift. So I know the power of that shift in paradigm. The moment you get to that point wherein, when others have a need, even before they ask you, you offer, can I help you? You're like, <laughs> isn't that doing the most? Yes, that is how you get the most out of life. So I want to encourage you. I know the power of this shift in mindset. You need to think not like the friend who always gets paid for. Start thinking like somebody who can pay for. Start thinking as somebody who can also pray for. Do you know that some of us, even if we have a slight headache, we already have somebody on speed dial that will call for prayers? Start thinking like somebody that others will call for prayers. Start thinking as somebody who will be there for people, making a difference in their lives. It starts with your mindset because if you can't see yourself, you can't even receive it. If you can't see yourself, how can somebody else see you? So come with me to Matthew chapter 4 verse 24. Don't worry, maybe on Tuesday I'll preach a message that is exciting because today we're very quiet. Matthew 4, 24. And look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, and epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. The Bible says they what? They brought to him everyone who had a need. I told you it's a very dangerous scripture, but it's a powerful weapon. He, they brought everybody, and the Bible says what? And he healed them. And the Bible says in verse 25, great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, from Jerusalem to Judea and beyond the Judah, beyond the Jordan. When the Lord opened my eyes to see what message of power is in this scripture, it did something to my spiritual psyche. Jesus said, as I am, so are you. And everybody that they brought who had a need, he met their need. Do you know that can be you? Every time you hear somebody having a need, and you're like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, poor Jane, sorry for her. Jesus did not do, oh, poor Joe, sorry for him. He healed them. He met their need. So who is lying here? Your mentality or Jesus. And because we know Jesus is the truth, that means my mentality is what needs to change. Because Jesus says, as I am, so are you. And so I need to get to a place wherein my mentality in believing the truth is so clear that I am able to meet the needs of others. It doesn't have to be that I am the one whose needs always have to be met. 
It doesn't have to be that I just look after myself alone as long as me and my family are fine. We're okay. God intends for people to be brought from wherever, however, and for you to have something to give. You don't necessarily have to change their credit score, but you can change their situation because he has given to you the power to make a difference. There is so much that God wants to give to us and he keeps saying, I keep seeing it, that there is a bottleneck and the bottleneck is in the mind. Your spirit is as powerful as God intends for it to be. But why is that power not being made manifest? Because the mind is not renewed enough to allow God to move through us as he should. So today we will pray. Every single one of us, we're going to pray. We're going to pray from James chapter 1, verse 7. And we're going to read it in a minute. But the reason why we're praying is because we need help in being baptized unto repentance in our minds. Because if we don't have that transformation of heart, there is no way we can fulfill all of what God intends for us to fulfill. I've been telling my wife lately, I said, some days I feel like maybe Jesus should not even come now. You know, because my message or my posture for a very long time was like, oh, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Yes, he is coming. But some days I feel like, these days I feel like, yeah, maybe not yet. Because there is still so much to do. You understand so what I mean? And he says, I am coming and my reward is with me. And if he's coming to reward the works, how well are we working the works? How well are we turning others to righteousness? You understand what I mean? And it's because of thinking, such thinking as this, that his coming is delayed. Do you know that I stumbled on a video on YouTube uh, a couple of days ago of a message that I preached in 2020, thereabouts, and when I was preaching, I started to prophesy. I said, do you know that Jesus can come back in 2023, but his coming could also be delayed till 2075. And I said, what determines whether he comes in 2023 or 2075 is how ready we are because he doesn't want to just come and surprise us so that the coming of Jesus should not be a defeat for you. It should be victory. You understand what I mean? It shouldn't be a defeat, it should be victory. Yes, the little that you, you've done, he will magnify it, but you still have to at least do that. You understand what I mean? And so I'm like, man, 2023 is where we're at now. 2075 is a long time, and I hope he doesn't delay that much. But the reality of it is this. He says, I am coming. And he put a condition to it. He says, I am not coming until this gospel of the kingdom has been preached to the ends of the earth. And what is the kingdom? The kingdom is not just preaching. Okay, let me do something. Because that was where I was supposed to start, but I skipped it. So let's just quickly go back to that same Matthew chapter 4 again. Before we read verse 24, let's read verse 23. And I'll, and I'll show you that the kingdom of God, the gospel is not just talking. Because that's what we've mostly done. We've done very well at it in the body of Christ. Verse 23 says, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sicknesses, and all kinds of diseases amongst the people. He taught, but he also met needs. He also healed. So when he says this gospel of the kingdom, he's not just talking about preaching the gospel, he's talking about transforming lives as we go along the way. But here we are, how much of that have we done? We talk to people all day long. Even the same believers that were supposed to be encouraging each other in hymns and in spiritual songs, our hands are short toward them and our commitment is only to us and we just leave them to fight the good fight of faith on their own. It's not just preaching, it is doing. Because we somehow managed to continue to delay his coming because, look, let me say this. Let me say this. I'm going to say this very quickly and then we're going to close. You know one of the things that Jesus said in, the, in Revelations that he kept repeating? He says, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me. He's not just enticing us to behave. He's letting us know that the reason why he's coming is because he wants to reward what we have done the cold water that we have given to those who are thirsty. So if you haven't done that, he's not eager to come. He doesn't want to find you like the fig tree was found without knobs. He is delaying for your sake. 
So if you want to continue to enjoy the delay, knock yourself out. But I will walk the walk of him who has sent me. Now, James chapter 1 verse 7 is a kind of rebuke, but today it feels like a rebuke day, so let's just, just get it out of the way. Let's have the communion. The Bible says, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Let not that man. Now, verse 6 tells us a kind of man that should not expect to receive anything from God. And it says, let him ask in faith without doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of, his, of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Now, a man that doubts is a kind of man that should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. But also a man that buries his talent will not receive if anything at all that which he has will be taken and given. So I know that we condition our minds to think of God as, oh, he's merciful, I can do whatever and get away with it, especially in these times that we're living in and people are abusing the gospel of grace by teaching you to do absolutely nothing, don't even have the good works, just confess Jesus and wait for the rapture. And you can keep sinning along the way because grace covers you. They are not teaching, some people are not teaching that outside of the doctrine of hell. They are literally teaching what Satan presents. But when you look at the scriptures yourself, you will see that God expects you to demonstrate that you have faith by your works, by your good works. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your heavenly Father in heaven. Are you shining the light in people's situations? Are you shining the light into their darkness? This is what God wants. And until we wake up and recognize that we are the ones, let me tell you something, my desire, the Lord showed it to me today and I was so glad. I've been preaching some messages lately that get people really excited. And so when the Lord showed this to me, I wasn't particularly thrilled myself. And then he said to me, he says, let me show you the reason why we have to do this today. He showed me myself in the very near future. And what I saw I can only describe it as a very near future. And I am surrounded by people who are royalty. People who have the power to help. The power to shine the light. And when I saw that, I'm like, I like that one. He says, so you have to preach this one. You see, because we have to be those people who are making a difference. We're not supposed to just get so fired up in God's presence and be speaking in tongues and be shaking like water leaf. We're not supposed to just be those people who get so high that you're speaking in tongues and they spit all over your face. God is not impressed by every one of those things. Those things are needed for you to enjoy being in the presence of your Heavenly Father, but God needs you out there feeding people with knobs. So for the joy that is set before me, I took this bullet for every one of us today that I'm going to be here today and I'm going to teach on this subject of being blessed to be a blessing, of elevating our mindset so that we become those men who can expect to receive from God. But let not that man who does not see himself as a giver expect to be a receiver of God's blessings. <laughs> Kayla thought I was going to fall off. No, I'm pretty good at this thing now. You know, I'm always at the edge here. Sometimes I lean over and thank God for the locks that pull me back. Praise God. So I was going to break bread with James 1, 7, but because I've already kind of overdone it, we'll just break bread with Isaiah 25 instead. You know, I like for us to break bread with a fresh scripture. Isaiah 25, verse 7, I won't preach around it, but I'm just going to read it. Let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. You know, and incidentally, I think this scripture is actually more for you than anybody else. So let your heart be open. Isaiah 25, verse 7. He says, actually, I want to read verse 2, and I'm going to read verse 7. Because something is about to happen. I can see it. Some other people are singing it as well. But I'm going to tell you. I will tell you. Isaiah 25, verse 7. It says, you have made a city a ruin. A fortified city a ruin. A palace of foreigners to be a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Like I said, I'm not going to preach, but I'm just going to read this thing. But what I am reading to you is what is being said 
around the throne of God at this time. And it is coming. It, let him who has an ear. Revelation chapter 3 verse 13. Revelation chapter 3 verse 22. Let him who has an ear hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. It has had a palace of foreigners. But the Bible says it will not be rebuilt once it is destroyed. There is a palace in America that has been ruled by foreigners for a long time. It is called the banking system. Isaiah 25 verse 7. <laughs> I have joy. Praise the Lord. You see, a time is coming wherein if all we have is joy, we will be so content knowing that we have it all. The Economic Forum said that by the year 2030, and what they literally mean is 2023, they're just playing with numbers, you will have nothing and you will be happy. Right? That is only a lie of the devil. They say you'll have, you will own nothing and you will be happy. But what they're trying to tell you is what the word of God has already made clear to you that you will have joy and it will be everything. I speak to you because the devil is ready to fire some shots. In fact, the arrows have already left the bow. But I tell you in the mighty name of Jesus, I have joy. Isaiah 27, I mean 25 or 7. And he will destroy. You know that two weeks, exactly two weeks before those two banks were closed down. I was here. Remember that day that I wore the, the flamboyant suit? I've been asking my wife, can we have more of those suits? Everyone was complimenting me on the day. Everybody likes a little bit of compliment. The Bible says that a man... The Bible says a man is valued by what others say of him. Okay? So, but don't just compliment me for complimenting sake, okay? Don't do it out of sympathy. Do it when I wear something that is really worth of your, worthy of your praise. But on that day, I was standing here, and I told you that the Lord said to me that the angels who came to hold my hand during worship, that was a sign to me. Even though it was a good feeling, even if nothing came out of it, it just felt good. And he said to me, he says, you have to sign, now release the word. Two weeks before those banks were closed. And what did I say? I said, the time is coming and I tapped this thing that people will not be able to get their money from the bank and they would say that the banks have been hijacked, but it is also by the same people. And what do we see? The same banks were taken over by the same people. And people could not take their money. You understand what I mean? You see, the Bible says God watches over his word to perform it. I think even we need to start watching over God's word by prophecy so that we can be ready for when it happens. You understand what I mean? So what I'm saying to you today is of the order of that signature. Somebody got it, but somebody didn't. The Lord said to me, I have given you a sign. Speak the word. Literally, the word sign and the word signature is the same. And one of those banks is called Signature Bank. You see, prophecy is not that difficult anymore if you're just listening to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. You see what I mean? He says, I have given you that as a sign. That was his signature. What is God's signature? Love. His signature is love. Out of his love is getting us prepared. There is, there, there is so much more, but I want to tell you this for a fact. You just do the little that he's asking you to do. You'll be amazed at how God is going to move on your behalf when the time comes. Isaiah 25 verse 7, he says, And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people and the evil that is spread over all nations. The reason why you need to rejoice at what's about to hit the world system is because God is bringing fire to drive out the fleas so that you can be refreshed. We're going into a time of refreshing. 
And then afterwards, the end will come. But the end is not going to come until we have first of all experienced the doing away with of evil. So when they say there's a casting down, don't join them. Say there's a lifting up. The Lord said to me on the 18th of February when I stood here, he said to me, tell your brothers and sisters that Satan has his dispatch riders waiting for you to slip with your mouth. Because the Bible says the power of life and death are in the tongue. And so when the angel of death comes and the reapers go ahead of him to separate the wheat from the tears, the wheat and the tears have been separated. So the angels of the Lord are waiting for the wheat. The angels of Satan are waiting for the tears. And the moment you open your mouth and say that you are doomed, you are doomed. But if you say, the Lord is the glory and the lifter of my head, he will lift you up. Don't let anything that is material have a hold on your heart. You have been warned. Begin to divorce yourself right now from mammon. So the day they tell you that mammon is no more, you will say the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you haven't done the surgery of separating your heart from material things, you see that place that you like to go would even cease to be. So if you do not separate your heart, you will find yourself saying what you shouldn't say. And the Bible says that in these critical times that we're in, every idle word that men speak, they will give an account of. You do not want all your good work to be ruined by one negative confession just because you were afraid for a moment. Practice preparedness. Tell yourself, if they take away every money there is, I will rejoice in the Lord because my confidence is not in mammon. My confidence is in the God who owns the cattle upon a thousand hills. My confidence is in the God of the army of angels. It doesn't matter if they tell me that the strongest army in the world that I know has been reduced to a heap of ruins. I will still rejoice in the God of my salvation. It doesn't matter if people that I felt were trustworthy in government, in business, in positions of authority turn out to be scams. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation simply because I may not be, I may be here, but I am not from here. I'm in this world, but I am not of this world. There is a revealing of good that is coming, but it means that evil has to be set on fire. And the word of the Lord has come to you today. Isaiah 25, verse two and seven. I heard it, it was read before the presence of God. And I tell you, it came with the same signature as the prophecy of February 18th. God is teaching us how to be spirit beings in the material world. And to be a spirit being in the material world means Thank you, Jesus. Let us break bread. Hmm. The Lord is equipping us in this place and I am glad. Father, thank you. The Lord is lifting us up. The Lord is strengthening us. The Lord is equipping our faith. Hey, thank you, Lord Jesus. The Lord is letting me know that the things that you don't even know how to do, as long as you present yourself before the Lord, he has angels that would do it for you. I saw the image of a lady standing in front of a mirror and angels were doing the lace of her dress in the back because her hands cannot reach it. And the Lord is saying, that is how I am preparing you. I just need you to stand in my presence. I'll do the work of fixing you up, getting you ready, making sure that you're girded about as you should be. But you need to stand before me. Let me prepare you so that when you step out, you will do good works. Hey, rabo shalagadi mosunturi alala. Hey, la raboske alala la la rodos kotolo dori gedeva. You see, some of us we have been enjoying people in our lives, blessing us, being there for us, helping us to watch kids. And the Lord is saying, you need to call them and ask them, what can I do for you? Let us not assume that it's their responsibility to be nice to us. Let us not say, well, I mean, what are they supposed to do? Their grandparents, after all, no. The people first. Ask them, what can I do for you? The Lord is saying that there's a lot that you need that is tied to that act of honor. Even if they say, no, we're good. Insist. 
<laughs> it's the little things. God is not complicated. It is the world system that is Babylon, confusion by mixing. God is just saying the little things. Just ask them, what can I do for you? If they say no, insist, do your research, find something, spoil them a little. It is called honor. But what that will do for you is it will allow for you to make room, buy an expensive gift. If they struggle to receive it, force it into their hands because you are making open your window for a blessing. Praise the Lord. You're making open, when I say your window, I'm talking about the window of heaven that is holding your blessing. It's in your hand. I have told you, it's in your hand. God is good. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this prophetic hour. Thank you, Lord, because we have heard in our ears and our spirits are glad. Now we make our minds subject to transformation so that we are not as we came, but we are renewed that we may be able to discern that which is your good and acceptable and perfect will. Kabush, abush. Ye babush, ye babush, abush. Abush, abush, ye babush, abush, abush, ye babush. The Lord is saying, be counted with the saints. Be numbered with the wheat. Ye babush, habush. Ye habush, habush. He says, I have given you the seal of righteousness. Don't lose the seal. Be exercised in the seal of righteousness. He babush, kabush. Be numbered with the saints. Ha! Oh, when the saints go marching on. Oh, when the saints go marching on. Oh, Lord, I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching on. Father, we thank you because we will be numbered. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. In Jesus' name, in remembrance of him. Amen. Alrighty, God is good. So, let us just, um, oops, praise the Lord, we have prayed. I, was, I saw a time that we were praying for the renewing of our mind, and I said we're going to pray tonight, uh, but the Holy Spirit says we have prayed. Oh yeah, praise the Lord. And so I just want you to be fully expectant. You will see transformation in your own life. You will see the abilities that have been there that you did not even know. It takes willingness to bring about the release of that divine enablement within you that will change the world, change those around you, and by so doing, give you the much elevated need. Let them see you so that they can be blessed and so you can be elevated. God bless you. I'll see you on Tuesday, God willing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord praise. God is so good. We thank God for this equipping. We know what to do. <laughs> uh, you can't get no more plain than this. This was, um, this was on time. Um, as we prepare to give, I want to encourage us with this. The book of Matthew. Chapter 10, verse 8. It reads here, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Let's give in faith tonight. And we know even as the man of God ministered that we know our um, the ask that has been placed before us financially, the scriptures say to give the tenth and for us to give offering unto him. But as we're giving, let it be a sign unto what we need to be doing in our life, those that the Lord has placed around us. Father, we give you praise for the word. Search us tonight, O oh God, and bring to our remembrance those that you have sent us, O oh God, for no matter where we are, wherever we think we are, O oh God, in life and our families and our situations, O oh God, that there's still something.
for us to give. And so, Lord, let this act of giving, even in the tithe and offering, O oh God, be pleasing unto you. Let it stir up in us afresh tonight that spirit of giving. For, Lord, truly, freely we have received, and we declare unto you freely we shall give. Lord, let these offerings be found pleasing. Let they be sweet-smelling. Lord, we give you praise, for you give seed to the sower. All the silver and gold belong to you, all the cattle. For you own the cattle on a thousand hills, O oh God. The mountains of precious stones, they all belong to you. Father, there is none like you. We say that all glory and honor belong to you. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. And so be it. Hallelujah. 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 Let's give the Lord praise on tonight. Y'all know we'll be back Tuesday, and this message will be um, live streaming tomorrow around about 6, 7 o'clock, so be on the lookout for that. So much we need to allow to get deep down in us. Uh, and one thing the Lord has even dealt with me on as of late, that while at work, you know, when I'm going to and fro, allowing the message to just be playing. You know, some of us got earbuds. You know, even when we're working, we can just let that thing get deep in, you see. And so I want us to be encouraged in that. If you need prayer, i love to touch and agree with you over here, especially in seeing and dreaming, because even the grace that has been uh, placed upon me, it helps when I can come into the message and I have already been seeing things. And then as the word comes, it ministers that interpretation, you see. And so I want us to grow in that because as the prophetic word comes, it helps if we have seen, because we are the ones that are upon the watchtower. So if you'd like me to touch and agree with you, please we'll be there. Father, we give you praise. There's none like you, O oh God. We thank you again. We cannot stop thanking you, Lord. If we had a thousand tongues, it still would not be enough to give you praise, to sing your thanksgiving, O oh God, for what you're doing in this hour. For we know indeed we have come to the end of the age. You have placed your signs, O oh God, in the stars. We see it being acted out upon the earth, O oh God, in the actors that you have set before us. Even as we have come to the company of innumerable angels, O oh God, we see them going to and fro. Lord, we thank you for your seal, which is the Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, we declare that we are blessed going in and coming out. Father, we thank you that you have made us the head and not the tail. You have placed us above and not beneath. All glory and honor belong to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, everyone said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have a blessed night.